invention, but you know yeah, what? Fantastic. I've got pins and needles Ooh. in my foot and it's really annoying me. Have you? Yes. Well, I've got a question <laughs> in our big email thing pile. Yes. Oh, loads of the loads questions of here. Them. But well, it, actually, there's one from Jennifer which talks about pins and needles, if no. I can just find it in here. Oh, there we are, my foot's in Why pain. do you get pins and needles in your hands and feet? Well, you had crossed legs, didn't you? Yes, I did. We well, well, absolutely. So, <laughs> but what's happening there is you're getting the blood is restricted to your foot. Oh, right, so it cuts so, off the yeah, blood supply so when, when you cross you your legs. There, you get pins and needles, and that's just a feeling of the blood rushing back into your foot. Ah, so all the blood is coming back to my foot now. Well, that's a good thing. Hopefully, the pins and needles will end. But now, talking of needles, on that subject, it's over 150 years since the first woman doctor graduated from medical school. And life was very different back then for doctors and patients. <laughs> to RE, but there's more than bats in this belfry. Because in the roof of this church, St Thomas's in Southwark, London, is the old operating theatre, the oldest in the UK. It was built in 1821, the same year that Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to get a medical degree, was born. Elizabeth was born in Bristol, but when she was 11, her family sailed to New York. Unusually for the time, her father made sure that she got the same education as her brothers. A dying friend told Elizabeth how much less she would have suffered if she'd been treated by a woman. Women weren't allowed to be doctors, but Elizabeth became determined to try. She applied to 16 medical schools. All of them turned her down flat except for the Geneva Medical School in New York, who allowed the students to vote on her admission. Thinking it was a hoax, they said yes. Elizabeth had her place. Elizabeth graduated in 1849 at the top of her class and determined to become a surgeon. But surgery in the middle of the last century was very different than it is today. This is a modern-day anaesthetics machine. Anaesthetics are drugs which block out the pain or put you to sleep. When Elizabeth graduated, anaesthetics had only just been discovered and many doctors were mistrustful of them. So patients had to rely on other methods. If you were a man and there was a fairground in town, you could get your friends to take you there so that the fairground boxer could knock you out before the operation. If you were a woman, you couldn't pay a boxer to knock you out, so doctors would have to try different methods. In your body, you've got about eight pints of blood, and doctors would remove four pints of it using leeches like these. They'd put the leeches on the patient's skin, and the leeches would suck out the blood until they were full, and this would leave the patient feeling very weak, unable to struggle, and likely to faint. Something else guaranteed to make you drowsy were these. The hospital didn't want to give patients water from the Thames because it was so filthy. So instead, they were given between four to eight pints of beer a day. If you were going to have an operation, you'd be given even more alcohol. The idea was that you'd be so drunk, you wouldn't feel a thing. The operating theatre would have been heaving with medical students all of them trying to get a glimpse of the operation. Despite the fear, the alcohol, the bleeding and the heat from the overcrowded theatre, patients often weren't unconscious and had to be held down, at least until they fainted from the pain. Modern day operating theatres also have to be extremely clean, like these at Guy's Hospital in London. Today, we know that lots of diseases are caused by bacteria. These germs spread illness and are so small they can't be seen by the naked eye. Surgeons have to wash their hands with antiseptic soap, and if they touch anything, they have to do it again. And again, and again. All of the instruments used in operations are sterilised. 
And uh, surgeons have to wear clean clothes like these, called scrubs. Unlike in the past, when they wore old clothes and aprons, which were rarely, if ever, washed, patients wanted their surgeons to wear bloody aprons because it meant they were experienced. If your surgeon was wearing a clean white apron, then it might mean that you were his first patient. Instruments weren't sterilised, they were just wiped on a sleeve and put back in their case, and surgeons only washed their hands after operations. Surgery was gruesome and bloody and thought of as no place for a woman. Elizabeth was determined to prove everyone wrong and so moved to Paris to get the training that she needed. While she was there, Elizabeth caught a disease from one of the patients and lost her sight in one eye. This meant she couldn't become a surgeon. However, she was determined to finish her training as a doctor and in 1858 was the first woman on the British Medical Register. By the time Elizabeth died in 1910, she had founded a hospital in New York and campaigned for new standards of hygiene in medicine. Although Elizabeth never did fulfil her dream of becoming a surgeon, she did blaze the way for women to follow her. Today, there are 26,000 female doctors in the UK, and it's thanks to women like Elizabeth Blackwell. Very nice. You like leeches, Ooh, don't you? As you long like as them. they stay in the jar, thank you very much. Oh, really? Yes, really. And then it would leave the patient feeling very weak, unable to struggle, and likely to bed! Brave girl. <laughs> they were very fast. Now, back to science. Absolutely. Now, Stephen Milner wanted to know how you work out the volume of an object, which is the amount of space it takes up. And the answer was actually mm -hmm. discovered by accident by a Greek mathematician called Archimedes in the 3rd century BC. He was asked by the king of Syracuse to make him a crown made out of pure gold. But in order to do this, Archimedes had to know its exact volume. But how? Well, he mulled the question over and over until one day he stepped into a bath overflowing with water. Whoa! <laughs> and on jumping in, he realised that the volume of the spilt water was equal to the volume of his body. Eureka! Back to the crown. Archimedes realised that if he collected the amount of water displaced by the crown, then collected the amount of water displaced by a block of gold of the same weight and compared the two, if they were both the same, then the crown was made of pure gold. Very clever. Mm. Now, rumour has it that on this discovery, Archimedes jumped out of his bath, ran naked through the streets, shouting, Eureka! What am I doing with that? Oh, thank goodness oh, for that. Oh, go on. No. OK. Moving swiftly on, Peter Briggs from Exeter wanted to know why clothes look darker when they're wet. It's a good question. Would you it like is? to remove your jacket, please? Oh, OK. <laughs> because you'll notice today Connie is wearing a very nice, brightly coloured jacket. And the reason it looks so bright is because at the moment the sunlight is reflecting very nicely on it. And you'll notice that if I shine this torch on the jacket, the jacket gets even brighter. And that's because it's reflecting the light. But hmm. if I come over here to where Mr Matt Baker is his lovely bath, <laughs> And I just drop half the jacket <gasps> into the bath like oh, this, give it a good jump, jacket. soaking it in water. Sorry, Connie, you can wear it later. <laughs> You'll notice that half the jacket has gone a lot darker. And the reason for that is the water at the bottom half of the jacket is now absorbing some of the light. And so to the eye, it looks darker. Ooh. How are you? It's a bit nippy having a bath in the garden, like, but uh, my teeth are chattering a little bit. Not it's fine. a good reason you mentioned that, because Mark Taylor asked a question about that. And the reason why we shiver and we shudder is because the body is attempting to warm itself up. And when we shudder, our muscles are actually working overtime. And if you think about it, when you go out for a run, you get really hot. And that's because the muscles are working. And when they work, they produce heat. Now, when we shudder, we're not actually running, but our muscles are producing just enough heat to keep our body warm. He knows his stuff. Right. Well, I think we should leave him to it, do you? Yep, come on. You stay on the garden. Let's dry you off. <laughs> oh. Cliff Bloomfield has a question, and his question is...